We now want to move and speak very briefly to talk about the Good Shepherd and the person of Jesus. The Pharisees in Luke 15, verse 1, says to, they say to, to Jesus, why does this man receive sinners and eats with them? Jesus replies by the telling of the famous story, uh, deceptively simple, of the Good Shepherd and the lost sheep. Let's look at the text. Which man of you, having a hundred sheep and having lost one of them, does he not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness? Notice, first of all, we're talking about a bad shepherd who loses his sheep. The shepherd will become a symbol for Jesus. Right now, it's a symbol for the Pharisees who are his audience, who have lost their sheep. And basically, Jesus is saying, you lost your sheep. I show up and go after them and bring them home. And you come to me griping, and I can't believe it. I'm making up for your mistakes. I'm doing what you should be doing, but you fail to do it. So what does he do? He leaves the 99 in the wilderness, which is the audience, and we don't know what's going to happen to them. But then in the middle, and we've got enough, I think we can get it on the screen for you, we have seven little tiny cameos of meaning. Go after the lost one until he finds it, and having found it, he places it on his shoulders rejoicing. And coming to, to the home, he calls in the friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. The Pharisees formed clubs in the local villages. They called themselves the Society of the Friends. So when Jesus picks up this language and starts talking about he calls in his friends, he is also echoing the Pharisees who are complaining. The friends of the shepherd rejoice over the fact that he's got the lost sheep back. And he's talking to an audience, are mad because Jesus has brought in the outcasts who don't keep the law. The story concludes at the end, even so I say to you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. This is sarcastic, who think they need no repentance. This refers to the 99 who are still out in the wilderness. Now, the, ch the chaser here, the critical point is that the lost sheep is a symbol of repentance. Even so, I tell you, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Oh, that one sinner is the lost sheep. What does that lost sheep do except get lost? It does one thing. It accepts to be found. It's scared to death a lion is going to come and eat it, and all of a sudden somebody shows up and picks it up and is going to carry it home. And it is delighted. And if you remember the icon we showed you a few minutes ago, the sheep over the shoulders of the shepherd is smiling. And so Jesus is redefining repentance. For the rabbis of the period in which Jesus lived, Repentance was a work which we do, which if done with sufficient quality, God is going to be pleased and will reward us with forgiveness and salvation on the basis of the quality of my repentance. So what is the work? You confess your sins. You make compensation for them. If you stole money from somebody, you give it back to them and so on. And then you demonstrate your sincerity in the keeping of the law. And by the time you finish the work of repentance, you're allowed back in. Jesus says, no, we get lost whether we keep the law or whether we don't. And God in Christ comes after us and carries us home. It's a work which he does and we accept to be found. The prodigal in the story of the prodigal son accepts to be found. The older son at the end of the story stands out in the courtyard and we don't know whether he accepts to be found or not. The story closes before we're given that information because the audience is represented in the older son and they have to decide what they're going to do with Jesus because the father, as he goes down and out to talk to the older son, again becomes a symbol of God in Christ coming to try and get us home. So what have we learned from this incredible story? Much more than we have time to talk about, but let's pick up a few things. First of all, it talks about failed leadership. Shepherds who lose their sheep 
and really don't care whether anybody goes after them or not. Then it talks about freely offered grace. The lost sheep does not earn the right to be rescued. It is a gift. It comes to him by the graciousness of the shepherd who goes out, picks him up, and carries him back. Incarnation and atonement are there. The incarnation, he comes after me. The atonement, he carries me back to the village. The nature of sin is also defined. Sin means that we can't find our way home. We have done those things and we have gone into ideologies which make it impossible for us to make our way home. And that's loud and clear in the story as well. The theme of joy is loud and clear. The shepherd and his friends rejoice. The sheep is rejoicing. It is not remorse over I blew it Look how badly the mess I made my life out of. But the authentic acceptance of being found, the mood is joy. And that is what is reflected in this story. Repentance, as we've noted, is a redefinition of repentance, namely acceptance of being found. We're talking also about the individual and the community. David told a story about an individual himself. The Lord is my shepherd. That story is retold by Jeremiah in chapter 23, in which it's now a story about a lost flock. God is the shepherd who's going to pick up Israel, the lost flock, and get it back to the Holy Land. Ezekiel picks up the same story in Ezekiel 34 and takes four verses and expands them out into 34 verses. And in that, in that occasion, he tells a long story with the same theme, and again, it is the entire flock that is lost. The story is Zionized. It is politicized. What does Jesus do? He takes both of those themes and he puts them together in a single story. We now have a lost sheep. We also have a lost flock. How do you mean a lost flock? The last time we heard about the 90 and 9, they were still in the wilderness. Now, what we expect to happen is that the shepherd finds the lost sheep, carries it home, ties it up, skedaddles back out into the wilderness, finds where he left the 90 and 9 in some valley somewhere, and then he leads them back to the village. I write scripts for feature-length films, and I'm looking for dramatic scenes and what goes on in those dramatic scenes. And in this story, there's a gaping hole. The shepherd finds the, leaves the 99 in the wilderness, finds the one, carries it back to the village, and then he has, sits down and has a party. Come on, man. You, you know, wh wh what about this 99 that are still out in the wilderness? He is trying to trigger his audience to realize the issue is that you also are lost. How much of the law you keep really doesn't make that much difference. And whether you left southern Iraq and got back to Jerusalem and so you're close to the Holy of Holies in the temple, that really doesn't make that much difference. What really matters is what is your relationship with God? And you can break your relationship while keeping the law and you can break your relationship while breaking the law. And the one is the lost sheep, and that represents those who break the law. And the ninety and nine are the ones that think they aren't lost, but actually they are because they're out in the wilderness. And how are they going to get home? The, this great gaping hole in the first of these three stories is finally closed in the third story, in which the younger son represents those who break the law, the older son who's still at home with a very bad relationship with his father. He represents those who keep the law. And the father goes down and out in order to rescue them both, the individual and the community. A lostness on a part of the individual and communities can also find themselves desperately lost and no way to get home. There is then also Christology. We find out something important about the person of Jesus in the 23rd Psalm and also here in the account of this story. Then attached to the end, this second story, or third story in our, what we're talking about now, and that's the story of the good woman. This is utterly amazing. 
because Jesus is saying, I am like the good shepherd. He's also saying, I am like the good woman. The good shepherd goes after his lost sheep and the good woman goes after her lost coin. The church has historically always seen Jesus in the story of the lost shepherd and it has historically neglected the fact that there is another story about the good woman. Jesus does this because he has men and women in his disciples and he wants to tell stories that will ring the big bells deep in the heart of both his men and his women. And if you look closely in the New Testament, as I have been privileged to do, you will find that every level of leadership in the church has some women, from disciples up to apostle, because Junia, in the seventh verse of the 16th chapter of Romans, it refers to her as an apostle. Probably this is Joanna in the Latinized, lang Latinized form of her name, and she is outstanding amongst the apostles originally and becomes outstanding amongst the apostles. So here we have Jesus the Good Shepherd and Jesus the Good Woman models for men in leadership in the Christian church and models for women in leadership in the Christian church and they are equal. And may we all take note of this, these powerful stories about the nature of the Good Shepherd and see how we live them out in daily life in our churches.